I'm Bonnie Herbe. Welcome to To The Contrary's annual film festival, all about women and girls. This week's winning entry won the U.S. Women's Issues Award. No Choice is about the fact that one in four women has an abortion, but no one talks about it. The filmmakers hope the stories you are about to hear help break the silence and the stigma and give a look at what America would be like without Roe v. Wade if there were no choice. When I realized I was pregnant, I realized I had to do something about it because I wasn't going to leave college. I wanted to be a writer. I've been writing since I was 15. I'm 81 years old. I was born in 1936. I've published 17 novels, 19 books of poetry, a memoir, a play, and four nonfiction books, and a book of short stories. I grew up in Center City, Detroit, in a predominantly black neighborhood at a time when anti-Semitism was rife in Detroit. I was raised basically by ghetto Jews. My mother was a housekeeper. She'd grown up in poverty. My life was nothing like the life that I saw on television, and I was trying to make sense of the discrepancies between life lived and as it was supposed to be. And I began writing both poetry and fiction. In my freshman year of college, I fell in love violently with someone who was most dangerous to me. That was where I first lost my virginity, was in his, in his old car in the back seat. He hated condoms. I insisted we use them, but he said no. In those days, contraception was illegal in many states, and it was certainly illegal for unmarried women. The attitude toward women was that we had no sexuality, and if we did, we were bad. It didn't occur to me I was pregnant, but my mother noticed that I didn't have my period. A number of my friends had gotten pregnant in high school, and I saw what happened to their lives. Often the man would leave. Uh, and you'd be there with a baby, and you had no education, and the jobs open to you were minimal. At that time, if you were affluent, you flew to Puerto Rico or Mexico, or your gynecologist might do it. But I was a poor kid from a work, working class neighborhood, and I didn't know any abortionists. I aborted myself by taking tweezers and pushing them into my womb, opening it and pushing inside. The pain was so intense, I passed out. I woke up on the floor in a pool of blood and the blood kept coming and coming and coming and I almost bled to death. The women's movement was in its heyday. We could summon thousands of women into the streets of cities to, to fight for abortion. We fought for it, we politicked for it, we lobbied for it. The other major story today is the decision of the United States Supreme Court. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortions. Specifically, the court today overturned laws in Texas and Georgia. The decision to end a pregnancy during the first three months belongs to the woman and her doctor, not the government. The Roe v. Wade decision did not come down from the Supreme Court. We agitated. I always think of my grandmother's life and my mother's life as opposed to mine, the choices that were available to us, how much more I could have than they had. As a result of my abortion, my opinion of myself went way up. 
I had been willing to almost die to take control of my life. I felt that I had learned how strong I was. And I felt that the path was now clear for me to become the writer I wanted to be, which I would never have been able to do had I had a child at 18. I believe that Roe v. Wade, with the present judges on the Supreme Court, will probably be overturned. And if women don't take to the streets, they don't know what their lives can be like. A woman who cannot or does not want, for whatever the reason, to be pregnant will do anything, anything, to stop the pregnancy. And that's history. My dad was a general practitioner and the best. But I decided I wanted to do obstetrics, deliver babies, and gynecology. And I not only got it, but I was, quote, successful at it. I got out of medical school in 44. I was very lucky, and I received the residency in New York City that I felt would meet my needs, and that was three years at Harlem Hospital in Upper Manhattan. Everything that came through the doors was mine to take care of. And the numbers of incomplete, infected, bleeding, post-abortal pregnancies, it was awful. Who is doing the abortion? It's somebody probably untrained and may not even care what happens to the patient. And it's a back room, kitchen table type of thing. Now the patient may leave that not knowing that she's been damaged. She's paid her fee, which might be exorbitant, but she doesn't know that she's in trouble until she gets home and a day later or that same day, she begins to get terrible cramps. She's bleeding. And then somebody has to get her to go to a hospital. And some of them were afraid to go to a hospital because, oh, we would report them because abortion was illegal. And they were doing an illegal thing. I never once asked a patient, why did you do this? Well, this was not our business. This was their business. Despite the many that I treated, this particular case stood out. I had a very lovely woman of color, a nurse, came in because she had been aborted somewhere on Long Island. And uh, she didn't feel well. And we looked at, somebody said, oh, that's her umbilical cord hanging down. Well, when I went over to her, that umbilical cord was not that. It was her bowel. It was hanging to the floor. We removed her uterus, her tubes, her ovaries. She was never going to have children of her own. And there was feces all over her pelvis, of course. And, and we just washed and washed and washed. And I must tell you that six months later, I went to her wedding. She invited me to her wedding, and I was very happy to go. I never had done abortions, but I really learned how to clean them up after they'd been badly managed. And that cemented in my mind that why should that be? Why not have it that they can have it done better? My clinic on Beacon Street, we used to have on Saturdays like five or 600 protesters. 
I never dared park my car there, but they would find me and follow me along the street. I never felt morally that I was doing the wrong thing. I don't think that life, it, as we determine life, happens at conception. The possibility of life and looking forward to life, yes. My position was that I was taking care of a woman, a grown woman. And that to me took the place of stopping a pregnancy before it becomes that type of life. What do you mean, can I imagine it would happen if Roe v. Wade went away? Women would still have abortion. They not be able to have them in good hospitals by good doctors who were trained to do it if there was a law against it. Men are deciding these things. Women are not involved in the decision. They have committee meetings in dark rooms with eight men in ties. And they're deciding what a woman should be able to do with her own body. When I asked the Air Force doctor for birth control, the doctor asked me if I was married, and I said no. And then he asked if I was in a serious relationship, to which I also replied no. And he said, then you don't need birth control. I am a sister, a daughter, a wife, a veteran. I had a mom who was very much trying to assimilate into American culture and a grandmother very deeply rooted in our Mexican heritage. I always felt like I lived in between. So I would be listening to Selena and Los Tigres del Norte at home, but at school I'd be like, oh my gosh, do you not love the Spice Girls? Sexuality when I was growing up my mom was very open about it and I knew I could always come to my mom if I had a question, but my grandmother very much was being a virgin is everything and you save that for marriage and sex is bad. You just only do it for children. I know I wanted to serve since 9-11. I, I remember walking the hallways of my school and just being so confused but wanting to do something. I enlisted in the Air Force in 2006 I, at this point in my life, was very sex positive. I think sex was great. I had just learned how to have an orgasm. My life was so crazy at that point. I had just left Korea, and then I had received orders for deployment originally to Iraq. And I was like, all right, let's get everything going. So I was ready to get my items into storage. I had taken everything out of my apartment, and that's uh, on one trip to Walmart, I realized something is not the way it's supposed to be. So I took a test and found out I was pregnant, and all I kept thinking was I was letting my team down, and I was mortified that I'd be going back to the unit, and they would be like, oh, she's pregnant, and then just replace me. I knew I wanted an abortion but I couldn't go to a military doctor. Preparing for deployment is a very costly endeavor. I ended up spending quite a bit of money just getting new gear. So by the time that I realized that I needed this procedure, I was broke. I didn't know what to do, I was at the end of my rope. I called Planned Parenthood and I remember calling the North Dakota office. They referred me to a clinic in Minnesota. So I had to drive four hours, and then I would have to wait three days. I also thought, where am I gonna stay? So the only option was my car. And eating crackers and Gatorade. I'm like, we're going cheap. Like there's, I need to have enough gas to get me back to work after all of this is done and there was the option to be awake or not awake, but the not awake version cost 150 more dollars. And I was like, yeah, that's not gonna happen either. After the abortion, I wish I could say I had enough time to process exactly what had happened, but 
we literally went right into a war. I threw myself into work and I, I saw the benefits of it. I saw things that will forever change my life. And I had experiences that have made me who I am. And when I did deal with it, I just kept thinking like, I should feel guilty. Maybe I should feel guilty. Maybe I should feel sad about this. Maybe, maybe there's something really wrong with me. And it took a really long time to figure out that there wasn't. I had made the best decision for myself and part of comprehensive sex care and health care is abortion. I um, had a lot of trouble make, deciding whether or not to come here today, whether or not to do this interview. But ultimately I showed up and I showed up because I think it's vitally important to have this conversation. My name is Danielle Lang. I grew up in Levittown, Pennsylvania. I was raised Catholic. I went to church and Sunday school. I wanted to be an attorney because I, for as long as I can remember, wanted to make some sort of difference and appeal to justice in the world. When I accidentally became pregnant, I was 22 years old. Uh, it was a contraception failure. I was on the pill at the time. I had just graduated from NYU. I was studying for the LSAT while I was waiting tables. The decision uh, wasn't very difficult at all. I was not in a place to be a mom. Um, it was an easy decision for my partner. He also felt like he was not in a place to be a father. It was easy for me to find a doctor. The first time I went, she laid out all my options and said, if this is the decision you make, uh, it's totally medically safe and I'm happy to do it for you. What was harder, I think, about the process was what came afterwards and how I felt about it. Um, and it wasn't some sense of regret at all. It wasn't some sense that I'd made the wrong decision. But I do think I was surprised by how stigmatizing it felt, for lack of a better word. Um, that I suddenly felt like I had this secret that uh, the world was expecting me to keep, even though I didn't think it needed to be a secret. And it occurred to me after I'd had the abortion that I didn't, nobody had ever told me about theirs before. So I was kind of out there on my own. So I knew that lots of women do. And yet I looked around and there wasn't anybody talking about it. Babies are being murdered. All you hear is extremist rider. So that's the only voice in the room. Part of the extremist rhetoric is this idea that women will come to regret their decisions later. And that just seemed really wrong to me as somebody who's lived it. At least that's not the experience for the vast majority of women, and it certainly wasn't my experience. But if I didn't talk about it, and if other people don't talk about it, then how will people know that? How will people know that that's the wrong story to be telling? While I was in law school, the more work I did on reproductive rights issues, the more obvious it became how extraordinarily difficult it can be for women uh, to just access a clinic that can provide services. The restrictions in Texas were so extreme that it was gonna close almost all of the clinics in Texas. The case was headed to the Supreme Court and the idea was to have a brief from lawyers who'd had abortions to the justices on the court. Because we, in many ways, are their closest colleagues. I'm proud to say that I was one of the signers. And it was important to impress on the justices that this was an issue that not only affected women that they couldn't really imagine, but that it affected women that clerked for them that stood before them in court and argued that this was something that touched all women. And I'm happy to say there's a happy ending to that story. Women won today! Women won today! With this historic ruling, justice has been served and our clinics can stay open.
So long as the experience is shrouded in secrecy, so long as the people making decisions don't think about it as their colleagues, their friends, it'll make it easier to demonize the experience. And it's not gonna change just with me, but it is gonna change with individual voices and that's the only way it will change. Women of color have been trying to navigate and have ownership of their bodies since slavery. I grew up in Chicago on the South Side. We dealt a lot with poverty, especially after my dad was killed. Poverty, food insecurity, unstable housing, things like that. And then I headed off to a Catholic girls' school, and we weren't going to get any comprehensive sex education. And so I didn't know about my body. I didn't know about birth control. I didn't even really know, understand my period. The first time that I got pregnant, I had just gotten out of high school, so I was like 17. You know, I was not gonna be a mom. So I decided to have an abortion. I was very, very lucky that I didn't have to worry about trying to come up with the money. Uh, my mom and the guy paid for it. Yeah, that was, that was luck. And so I did have another relationship. He was a much, much older guy, and it was just an unhealthy relationship. He wasn't using condoms, and, and he wasn't going to use condoms. And so I'm 18, and this guy is 29, 30. Am I more powerful than him in our relationship? I don't think so. He was abusive. This didn't feel like a good love. I was always crying. I was always upset and unhappy. Um, and so I was making the decision that I was going to be leaving this relationship at some point, and I got pregnant again. And you know, at the very beginning, I thought about abortion, but I, you know, something in my head, I was just like, you know, I, I'm going to carry this pregnancy to term. I started writing my son love letters um, when I was pregnant with him. I just, I really wanted him. I was gonna try to work it out with the, the father. And so we got this apartment, but it was horrible. Yeah, I end up getting an a order of protection. You know, my son, he didn't ever go hungry, so we made it on a prayer. <laughs> we made it on a prayer. The birth of my second child came after I, you know, I had met somebody, got married, and I actually, you know, I planned her. There were a series of things that happened to put me on the path to become a professional activist. In the pro-choice movement, the conversation tended to center on just abortion rights. And women of color were like, that's not the totality of our lives. There's other things that are happening here. Reproductive justice is the merging of reproductive rights and social justice. The ability to carry a pregnancy at the term, the ability to terminate that pregnancy if the, the woman is not ready, and the ability to parent the children that, that she already has with all the adequate and necessary supports needed to do those things. And so that is really the reproductive justice model. Every woman has the right to make that decision for herself. We hope you found this edition of our All About Women and Girls Film Festival enlightening. Please follow me on Twitter 
and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week.